The S&P 500 increased 0.6% this week, and our classroom stock portfolio of high-yield dividend-paying companies now has an annual return of 33.79%, and it's beating the S&P 500 since the portfolio started. And our dividend growth stock portfolio has an annual return of 21.8%. It, too, is beating the S&P 500. And surprisingly, our high-yield portfolio increased its performance lead over our dividend growth portfolio, which is confounding to me, especially since I've invested more of my personal money into the dividend growth strategy. And I keep predicting the dividend growth strategy will be the better performing portfolio, but the high yield portfolio keeps expanding its lead. And like in last week's video, later in the video, I'll discuss ways to potentially boost the return of our stock portfolios, but it will require giving up some portfolio diversification. We are almost into the fourth quarter of the year. So how does the market do in the fourth quarter of the year historically? According to the Center for Financial Research, since World War II, the S&P 500 advanced 80% of the time during the fourth quarter. In comparison, the S&P 500 saw advances in the third quarter only 60% instead of 80% of the time. The Center for Financial Research believes the following may continue to propel the market higher in the fourth quarter. Number one, China's recent huge stimulus program. Number two, the ongoing easing in U.S. inflation readings as personal consumption expenditures, also called PCE, for August recorded another downtick in growth. And three, the likelihood of two more Federal Reserve cuts in the fourth quarter totaling 50 to 75 basis points. And while the third quarter earnings for the S&P 500 should rise 4.8% versus the 8.1% expected at the end of the second quarter, EPS growth should rebound in the fourth quarter and in 2025 by 12.4% and 14.3% respectively. Finally, history shows that all sizes, styles, and 9 of 11 sectors have risen in, the, in price in the fourth quarter of election year since 1992, along with 85% of the S&P 500's sub-industries. So, what is this slide showing? It's showing the portfolio value over time for our main portfolio, which invests almost exclusively in dividend growth stocks. In 2022, we started investing $12.50 each week into the portfolio, and it's now worth $2,487.77 after 143 weeks, a new high for the portfolio. Each week, we take that deposit and split it up to buy 10 different dividend-paying stocks, so that's about $1.25 per stock. And in August of last year, we started a second portfolio, this time investing in high-yield dividend-paying stocks. The tan line on the chart shows what the portfolio value would be if we'd instead put the money into a savings account. In our first year, 2022, stocks did not do well. As you can see, our portfolio had overall losses where the blue line falls below the tan savings account line. But the power of compounding is working in our favor as the portfolio really took off in November of 2023. I'll also update our tech portfolio later in the video, which has only existed since April of this year, but has been the best performing portfolio over that time, although with extreme volatility. And for those who have been asking, I put the dividend growth stock portfolio and the high yield stock portfolio on my site, which is beatthestockmarket.com. More on that on the next slide. Hi, Professor Rex here. If you're new to my channel, I teach college accounting. And I often show my students how to use the accounting concepts that I teach to pick stocks because it grabs the attention of my students and gets them engaged. To show them accounting concepts in action, starting about two and three quarters years ago, each Monday I invest real world money, $12.50 per week, which is roughly the equivalent of $50 each month, into 10 different dividend paying stocks. And because those original students are no longer in my class, I decided to make this video series to let them know how our portfolio is doing. Also, viewers can use our progress as inspiration for their savings goal and get ideas of company names that they can do their own research on. There are timestamp links in the description of the video in case you just want to jump to the list of stocks we bought this week or the list of our best performers or any other section of the video. In 2022, the year we started the portfolio, the market did not perform well, but because I don't believe in trying to time the market, we kept buying each week at what turned out to be great prices. Then in 2023, stocks took off. Currently, the portfolio's value is over $2,487. The portfolio's return has been 21.8% per year. And last year, the portfolio's return was 286 which beat the S&P 500. And in the preceding year, the portfolio once again beat the market. All right. For those that have requested it, I've now put the dividend growth stock portfolio on my website, beatthestockmarket.com. 
I've also put the high yield stock portfolio as seen later in the video on the website for subscribers. And because the high yield stock portfolio currently lacks any technology stocks, for those that might want to add some diversification to the portfolio, I've added to my site a list of technology focused investments that provide income with yields from less than 2%, like Microsoft, to yields as high as 10 to 12%, all of which I either currently invest in or have invested in. I'll also tell you which is my favorite. Of course, the technology focused investments with the higher yields don't have the chance to grow their distribution yields as fast as a company like Microsoft or Broadcom. There's always a trade off. For those that can afford a subscription, I'll continue doing these weekly videos on the weekend showing what I bought on the previous Monday. Subscribers will have real-time access to the list of stocks we buy each Monday, as well as real-time notifications when we sell a stock, which we did this last week, which was Gilead Sciences for a nice profit. Subscribers will also get a detailed report of portfolio holdings, and they will get access to the complete history of our trade confirmations. All right. In this video, we talk a lot about our dividend growth portfolio and our newer high yield portfolio, which is geared more towards those nearing retirement. The table at the bottom of this slide shows a portfolio comparison when both portfolios existed. The high yield portfolio was started in August of last year and the annualized return so far is 33.79%, which is surprisingly higher than our dividend growth portfolio, which has an annualized return of 24.37% over the same time period. Because remember, you gotta compare apples to apples. I would expect that the dividend growth portfolio would have the higher return over the long run, especially since the high yield portfolio has zero tech stocks so far, but time will tell. If an investor was solely investing in the high yield portfolio, I would think about supplementing it with some tech stocks for additional diversification. And as I mentioned before on our website, we have ideas for technology focused investments that provide income ranging from dividend growth stocks to closed end funds and ETFs. Now remember, the high yield portfolio has only existed for 13 months, so its annualized yield, excuse me, its annualized return will likely jump up or down to a greater extent than our dividend growth portfolio's return. This slide shows the cumulative growth of the dividends we've received in our dividend growth stock portfolio. Our dividends for the last quarter increased 51% over the previous quarter, and our dividends for this month increased 90% over the same month a year ago. So why do we only invest in dividend paying stocks in our two main portfolios? The two reason, excuse me, the first reason we stick with dividend paying stocks for our dividend strategies is, according to a Hartford study, over the past 50 years, dividend paying stocks vastly outperformed non-dividend paying stocks. The total return for dividend paying stocks have been 9.17% per year, but for non-dividend paying stocks, average return has been much lower at 4.27%. The study is updated each year, and so go check out the source link that I include at the bottom of the screen. Morningstar also recently released a report that went all the way back to 1927 and came up with the same conclusion. Dividend paying stocks have a higher return and less volatility than non-dividend paying stocks. That second point about having less volatility is probably even more important than the fact that dividend paying stocks have a higher return. So why is a lower amount of volatility so important? Well, it's much easier to stick with a less volatile investing strategy. The more volatile a strategy is, the more likely you are to panic and sell at the wrong time. So why are dividend paying stocks less volatile on average? Because most dividend paying companies are making a profit, which is why they have excess cash to pay, ba to pay back to investors. As you can see on the screen, risk and volatility of dividend paying stocks as measured by beta and standard deviation tend to be much lower for dividend paying stocks, and that's a good thing. And finally, the study also showed that the best performing stocks are dividend paying stocks that increase their dividends, which is why our classroom portfolios for the dividend portfolios only invest in dividend paying stocks that have increased their dividend recently. Now, BlackRock recently released a report showing that $10,000 invested in dividend growers and dividend initiators grew to 2.6 million versus 1.6 million for the S&P 500, a difference of 62.5%. That same $10,000 invested into non-dividend paying stocks only grew to 1.2 million. So stocks that raise their dividends, which is what a dividend grower is, or started paying a dividend, that's what a dividend initiator is, they beat the stocks that do not pay a dividends by 116.7%. Now, the holy grail of dividend investing is having a stock portfolio that produces two things. One, a growing stream of income that produces enough income to cover your expenses, plus extra cash to cover travel, vacations, luxury purchases, etc. 
And two, also produces a growing stream of income that grows faster than the rate of inflation. And dividend paying stocks historically increase their dividends significantly higher than the rate of inflation. This means that, uh, that quality dividend paying stocks can provide a growing income stream for a lifetime. Now this is in contrast to bonds, which do not raise their payment to bondholders. So here are two examples of stocks growing their dividend payouts over the years. The first is Broadcom. I bought Broadcom, a chip maker, in 2020, just four years ago for my taxable account. At the time, its yield was 5.01%, meaning for every $100 I invested in the stock, I would receive $5.01 or excuse me, $5 per year. The company has quickly grown the dividend to the point where the yield, based on the original investment, is now 8.21%. Of course, investors buying the stock now are not going to get that high of a yield because the stock's price has risen so much. That's why it's important to invest early and be patient. And I fully expect Broadcom to continue to increase its dividends well into the future. And if not, that's why we've constructed a diversified portfolio. This is the power of investing in a quality dividend growth company. My second example of a high quality company with a history of raising its dividends is Home Depot. In 2003, when I was attending college, I had started a dividend stock portfolio for the investment newsletter that I had started at the time, and Home Depot was recommended for that portfolio and is still in the portfolio today. At the time, its yield was a low 0.83%, meaning for every $100 I invest in the stock, I would receive only 83 cents per year. Seemingly not much to get excited about, but over the years, Home Depot has grown the dividend to the point where the yield, based on the original investment, is now 31.1%. And like Broadcom, while there are no guarantees, I fully expect Home Depot to continue to grow its dividend well into the future. Of course, investors buying the stock now are not going to get that high of a yield because the stock's price has risen. Again, this is why it's important to buy early and be patient. Now remember, Stocks historically have a higher return than bonds and are also riskier than bonds, but you certainly will not find a bond that pays anywhere close to the yields on the original investment that these two stocks are paying. And bonds do not increase their payout to investors like stocks can and often do. Another reason to own dividend paying stocks is for the potential to generate up to $123,250 of tax-free income each year if you're married and filing jointly. Remember, the ultimate goal of dividend investing is growing your portfolio to a point where it generates enough income each year to live off the dividends. And because companies historically increase their dividends above the rate of inflation, you have the ultimate income stream that not only covers your expenses, but grows over time. And if you're married and filing jointly, you can make up to $123,250 in qualified dividend income and pay zero federal taxes on those dividends if you have no other income. This is perfect for retirees. If you're single, that amount is $61,625. Those amounts often increase each year as a standard deduction increases and the tax brackets are adjusted. So how are these amounts calculated? First, you find the 0% tax bracket for long-term capital gain, and then find the standard deduction, which is located in IRS Publication 505, as you can see in 2024, the standard deduction increased, meaning that you can potentially earn even more tax-free income from qualified dividends. And then the final step is to take the 0% capital gains amount and add it to the standard deduction, which means we get a final amount of $123,250 that a married couple filing jointly could generate an income from qualified dividends that would be federally tax-free. So why did we choose to start investing in our model stock portfolio with only $12.50 per week, which is essentially the same as $25 per paycheck? I personally am investing a lot more than that in these dividend strategies, but for our classroom model portfolios, the main reason we started with a low weekly investment amount is because I wanted to show my accounting students that you do not need much to build a diversified stock portfolio. In fact, when I was only making $11,000 per year as an enlisted member of the military, I started my investing journey with only $25 per paycheck. In other words, the equivalent of $12.50 per week. And because my brokerage account, Fidelity, allows me to buy as little as a dollar per stock, we can quickly and easily create a diversified stock portfolio with little money. Now, originally when I started this uh, classroom stock portfolio, I invested $25 per paycheck but found the process to be so fun that I split it up and now invest $12.50 every week. And we boost the contribution once per year 
by the amount of inflation to replicate the fact that people's paychecks usually increase at least by the amount of inflation. By the way, I also invest in these same stocks in my retirement account and my taxable brokerage account. The research we talked in class is the same research I use for myself. Another reason I started with a low investment amount is because one day I was wondering how much a young person, in this case a 17 year old, needed to invest per week to accumulate $1 million at retirement. And it turns out it's only $11.74 per week. Of course, since most people's annual salary increases each year by the amount of inflation at the very least, I assumed the contributions would increase by 3% each year, which is around the historical rate of inflation. That means in the second year, it's assumed that the person invested an additional 35 cents each week for a total of $12.09 per week instead of the original $11.74. For our classroom dividend growth stock portfolio in year two, we boosted the weekly investment 82 cents for a total of $13.32 per week. In year three, inflation wasn't as high, so we boosted the weekly investment by only 49 cents for a total of $13.81 per week. Now, a very popular exchange-traded fund, ETF, that only holds dividend stocks is called the Schwab U.S. Dividend Equity ETF, ticker symbol SCHD. SCHD is a large holding in my personal account, so I've been tracking SCHD's performance closely with our two dividend-paying uh, stock portfolios. As of today, our dividend growth classroom stock portfolio's annual return is 21.8%. If we had instead Instead, invested the same exact amounts into SCHD on the same exact days, a portfolio's return would only be 12.11% per year, a difference of 9.69% per year. Now, our high yield dividend portfolio is also outperforming SCHD, but by an even larger margin. Obviously, there is no guarantee that our portfolio will keep outperforming SCHD at such a high rate, but I've been gradually selling off my personal SCHD holdings and reinvesting in our two dividend-paying classroom stock portfolios. I also prefer our actively managed classroom stock portfolio strategy rather than SCHD's purely algorithmic approach where no one is overseeing of the stock selection. SCHD has had, at times, had large positions in stocks I consider to be value traps. Now this slide shows our best performing stocks in our dividend growth stock portfolio based on when they were initially purchased. Evercore, an investment bank, and Broadcom both remain at the top. Both have total returns over 200%, which means the original investment has tripled. So far, two stocks have tripled and four stocks have doubled their initial investment, with ITT just missing the list with a 99.7% return in less than two years. Goldman Sachs makes a list this week with a 66.8% total return on its initial investment in less than a year and a half. Stocks in yellow, F&G annuities and Repositrack, have been sold. And remember that total return includes both the dividends the company has paid as well as the increase in the stock price. Now let's turn our attention to the strategy column, specifically the category called dividend growth stocks. About 90% of our investments made in this portfolio were made in these stocks, which means they are high quality stocks with a great track of increasing their dividend payouts to investors. The other 10% or so of, of investments so far have been invested in usually smaller under the radar companies like F&G annuities and Repositrack that have recently started paying a dividend. These under the radar dividend paying companies tend to be riskier because they're usually smaller, but studies have shown they historically beat the market averages by a significant amount. This slide shows our best performing dividend stocks this week. It does not include dividends. Now, like the last two weeks, we have sold, we have so many stocks that were up over 4.5% that I'm breaking this slide into three slides, one, for, one slide for each portfolio. This slide is for our dividend growth portfolio. The best performers this week were Albemarle, the lithium company, Lithia Motors, Lamb Research, Applied Materials, FMC, ASML, Papa John's, Eastman Chemicals, and NVIDIA. This slide shows our best performing dividend stocks this week for our high yield stock portfolio, which, uh, which has far fewer companies in it than the uh, dividend growth portfolio. The best performers were Tapestry at 12.6%, CVS Health, FMC, Cogent, I'm not even sure if I'm pronouncing that right, and Papa John's, uh, Papa John's International, which is pizza. And finally, this slide shows our best performing stocks this week for our tech stock portfolio. Some of these 
Companies pay dividends, some do not. Best performers were LAM Research, Applied Materials, ASML, NXP, Semiconductors, NVIDIA, and Globin. So here's our usual disclaimer. The presentation, or this presentation is for informational purposes only. It's not a recommendation to buy or sell securities or engage in any investment activity, blah, blah, blah. It's all well and fine to get investment ideas from others, but you always need to do your own research. So let's look at the stocks that we sold this week. We don't usually make sales, but this week we did. We sold, for the dividend growth portfolio, we sold Gilead Sciences. Um, it was held for about five months. We sold it for a total return of 27.7%. That's an annualized return of 78%. And we also sold it for a high yield stock portfolio. It had, it was bought on a different day, so it had a different total return. So the now remember these returns are based on the original investment. For the high yield portfolio, the total return was 25.7%. It was held for 5.3 months for an annualized return of 68%. And now, so Gilead, because the high yield portfolio, it has far fewer holdings than the dividend growth portfolio. When we sold Gilead Sciences, it was a large portion of uh, the portfolio. So we had a lot of money to reinvest. And I'll tell you the stocks we reinvested in it in just a bit. So let's talk about the dividend growth stocks we bought last Monday. Here are my ratings for the top 15 dividend paying stocks this past week. These are dividend growers. But remember, we only buy the first 10. We purchase the first 10 stocks on the list that are not in the yellow highlight. Stocks in yellow, which in this week was Microsoft, have already grown to be 4% or more of the portfolio, so we did not invest more in Microsoft this week because we want to build a more diversified, less risky portfolio. New to this new to this new to the list this week is McKesson, which operates in the healthcare distributor sub industry. So since we're only buying 10 stocks and we're investing such a small amount each week, it means we are buying fractional shares in a Fidelity brokerage account. And for those that have asked, we do not automatically reinvest dividends into the same stock from which the dividend was paid. Instead, each week when we are buying the 10 stocks, as shown on this slide, we combine the weekly deposits with the dividends that have been paid that week. And if we sold a stock, which we did with Gilead Sciences, we take that um, those funds, split it up, and invest in the top 10 stocks. Now, for the sake of convenience, there's nothing wrong with simply turning on your broker's auto reinvest feature. But I think it's more ideal to reinvest in our top stocks each week instead of potentially reinvesting in a stock that is fairly valued as opposed to undervalued. The table on this slide includes a company's sub-industry, how undervalued they are according to our research, their risk rating, quality grade, and dividend yield. The most undervalued stocks last week appeared to be ASML, Constellation Brands, and Qualcomm. Remember, all these stocks pay a dividend and recently increased their dividends, and our methodology used here indicates they're likely to continue to raise dividends. Therefore, this is a dividend growth strategy. The stocks with the highest yields were, in order, Bristol-Myers, Chevron, Morgan Stanley, and PNC Financial. Now, remember, this dividend growth stock portfolio is in a brokerage account separate from my regular brokerage account to make tracking this portfolio easier. So in my other brokerage accounts, I'm also investing in these dividend growth stocks and the high yield stocks on the next few slides. This week, I purchased over $2,300 of these stocks as I reinvest dividends and gradually transfer out of my main dividend ETF and buy these stocks instead. I'm also trying to tweak the buying strategy a bit to see if I can boost returns because it's fun. And I'm never satisfied. I always try to increase the performance without taking on too much risk. Anyway. I'll share the results with you once I have enough data. And so far, the results are looking good. On this slide, I want to show the components to our quality grade for the dividend growth stock portfolio. Quality-wise, we only invest in stocks rated B- minus or better for this portfolio for 90% of our purchases. The other 10% so far have been invested in smaller, usually smaller, under-the-radar companies that have recently started paying a dividend. Those under-the-radar dividend-paying stocks tend to be riskier because they're usually smaller companies, like the Repositrack that we saw earlier, and F&G annuities. But studies have shown they historically beat the market averages by a significant amount. All the stocks we bought this week 
uh, qualify as high quality and are dividend growth stocks, which means they have a history of substantially raising the dividends that they pay to their shareholders. Now, remember last week we did buy an under the radar dividend payer, that was T-Mobile. Um, remember, they're usually smaller, but obviously T-Mobile is not a small stock. So on this slide, risk is the first quality component, which we mentioned on the previous slide. The next quality component is competitive advantage. Obviously, the more competitive advantages a company has, the better investment candidate they are. The next quality component attempts to evaluate the company's management. Our evaluation includes both management's use of capital and general decision making, but also our research dives deep into accounting data to look for red flags in the company's accounting practices, as well as the quality or reliability of their reported profits. And finally, the last quality component is financial health. If you're looking for lower risk stocks, I would suggest looking at Microsoft, Nike, Broadridge, and Yum Brands. Remember that the risk rating is comparing these stocks to other stocks, not to other investments like bonds or CDs. The companies earning the highest financial health ratings last week were Applied Materials, Microsoft, and Broadridge. Now let's look at the dividend growth grades of the companies. Remember, historically, the best performing stocks are those that both pay a dividend and have grown their dividend recently. As you can see under the grade call, Grade for Recent Dividend Growth and Current Yield, the stocks with the best combination of dividend growth and a higher yield are Applied Materials, Lamb Research, Bristol Myers, Applied Materials, oops, I said that twice, Lamb, Weston, Chevron, PNC Financial, and Morgan Stanley. Ideally, you want a higher dividend, high recent dividend growth, and the best potential for future dividend growth, but that's not the way it works. That's kind of getting greedy. Companies that are already paying out higher dividends rarely have the greatest potential for the greatest growth in those dividends. And our list, as you can see from the last grade called Dividend Growth Potential, the companies in the best position to increase their dividends substantially are Bristol Myers, Applied Materials, and McKesson. They earned an A- minus or better grade. The companies with the best combination of recent dividend increases, current yield, and potential of future dividend increases are Bristol Myers, Applied Materials, Lamb Research, McKesson, and Lamb Weston. Here are trade confirmations from last Wednesday, or from last Monday for the dividend growth stock portfolio. We took the weekly deposit plus any dividends we had recently been received, and we took the proceeds from the sale of Gilead Sciences, and then invested the total amount into the top 10 stocks on our buy list for the week, as long as they don't have a portfolio allocation of 4% or greater like Microsoft. Now let's talk about ways to potentially increase the return of our dividend growth portfolio. For those that are okay with giving us some portfolio diversification, remember we got 98 holdings in this portfolio, I believe there are four potential ways to boost the portfolio's returns. Each week, Remember, we buy 10 different dividend paying stocks ranked 1 through 10. On average, the stocks ranked 1 through 5 outperform the stocks in positions 6 through 10. Therefore, the first way to potentially boost returns is to buy only the stocks rated 1 through 5. However, the downside is this reduces portfolio diversification, but some investors are comfortable with a more concentrated portfolio. I'm not. I prefer uh, more diversification. Option number two. Don't limit individual portfolio holdings to 4% of the portfolio's total value. Normally, if a stock's allocation of the portfolio is 4% or greater, I won't purchase more of that stock. This technique reduces the portfolio's risk by ensuring the portfolio does not become heavily weighted in one or two stocks. I purposely created this portfolio so it would be very diversified because the ultimate goal of dividend investing is to have the dividends cover all your expenses plus generate extra income for travel, vacations, etc. But I'm a conservative investor and I'm personally investing a lot in these dividend portfolios. So I want to make sure the portfolio is not only well diversified between sectors, but also between industries and even sub industries. That way, when the inevitable dividend cut happens, it won't affect one's cash flow in a major way. However, an investor who has a higher risk tolerance and therefore doesn't mind a more concentrated portfolio might try removing the 4% limit in an attempt to boost the portfolio's return, especially if the company is in the top five of our rankings. And number three, the under-the-radar dividend payers, despite having some incredible performers like F&G annuities 119% gain in 12 months, and Rapaza tracks 97% gain in the same time frame, on average, they have not performed quite as well as the dividend growers in the portfolio. So skipping the under-the-radar dividend payers so far would have been an option to try to boost a portfolio's return and would have worked. 
one possible reason these stocks haven't done quite as well as the dividend growers is because many of the under the radar stocks are very small companies and small stocks as a group have not performed as well as large stocks in recent years. Some might say that they are due to outperform in the future. Like the previous strategies, this method reduces portfolio diversification. And number four way to try to boost the portfolio's returns Sell when a stock is fairly valued, even if dividend and quality metrics are excellent. Now, we do not sell often in the portfolio, definitely not weekly, and tend to only sell if the company cuts a dividend or the stock appears to be overvalued or the company's dividend and quality metrics fall out of the top 50%. In other words, if a stock appears to be fairly valued, but the dividend and quality metrics are still good, we usually will not sell the stock just because it's fairly valued. But if you have your own valuation methodology and your methodology signals that the stock is fairly valued or even overvalued, you might try selling at that time and reinvesting in that week's top 10 stocks that we are buying. The downside would be a higher turnover, but this could boost your portfolio's returns by not holding on to fairly valued stocks. If you try this, I'd be very interested to hear your results. Of course, this fourth strategy is the most difficult to implement because you have to implement your own valuation methodology. And for those looking for a less hands-on approach, let's talk about some options to potentially simplify things. For our model portfolios, we invest weekly, but there is no hard and set rule that says to do that. Most people invest with every paycheck, meaning that most people have funds taken out of the paycheck, which is usually every other week, and it's automatically invested in their 401k. When I started our dividend growth stock portfolio, as I mentioned before, I originally started investing $25 every other week instead of $12.50 every week. I only switched from every other week to weekly because I found the process to be fun. The advantage of investing every week as opposed to every other week or monthly is you get more diversification. So if one doesn't mind less diversification in their portfolio, option one is to invest every other week or even monthly instead of weekly. Option two is to just buy the high quality stocks, meaning those with a quality rating of B minus or better and hold and hold forever. Over time, some will turn out to be clunkers, but this will be just a small part of your portfolio as you let your winners run. On this slide, we're looking at stocks that have raised their dividends recently. The holy grail of investing in dividend paying stocks to have the portfolio generate enough dividends to cover your annual expenses. A level I've reached despite being on a teacher salary. Historically, dividend paying companies raise their dividends from 5 to 6% per year on average, which is above the historical rate of inflation. This means a stock portfolio can produce an ultimate passive income stream, that being one that increases each year above the rate of inflation. Now, this week, T-Mobile recently announced it will increase its dividend an incredible 35.4%. McDonald's also increased... Uh, its dividend this time by 6%. Now the last 22 dividend increases for the portfolio have an average of 10.4%. This slide shows stocks in our portfolios that have chosen to split their stocks. Since we keep track of every individual purchase in Excel, it's important that we have this slide to remind us to go back and adjust the purchase price, shares held, and dividends per share that we receive once a stock split has occurred. And we do have a stock split coming up. That's LAM Research on October 2nd. Here's a look at the 10 stocks that make up the largest portion of the dividend growth portfolio as of Sunday. Currently, five stocks comprise 4% or more of the portfolio, with Legion still leading the way. Remember, our goal is to build a conservative and diversified portfolio by limiting the amount we invest in one single company. Aggressive investors might not want to limit the investment in any one stock. But, like I said, I'm a conservative investor, therefore we temporarily stop investing in a company if they make up more than 4% of our portfolio. This leads to a less risky, more diversified portfolio. It's true that our portfolio's returns would likely be higher if we had always invest in our top 10 stocks, regardless of the size of the stock's portfolio allocation, but that also creates a more concentrated, more volatile portfolio, and many investors cannot psychologically stick with a volatile portfolio. Volatility often causes investors to panic and sell at the worst time possible. Now, our portfolio holdings are at 98. That might seem like a large number of companies to keep track of, but the spreadsheet we have developed for tracking the companies makes it obvious when to sell a company once we download company financial and accounting information into the spreadsheet, which we do at least weekly, and it doesn't take that much time. The thing that it was time consuming is the two years it took to develop the spreadsheet. 
All right, let's talk about our high yield dividend paying stock portfolio, the one that's performing better than our dividend grow, surprisingly. I've had several older students who are closer to retirement take my classes. They were more in interested in stocks with higher dividend yields and asked to start a portfolio using a strategy featuring stocks with higher yields than the stocks in our dividend growth portfolio. So just for fun, in August of last year, we started investing $12.50 each week into a different portfolio. And these were stocks with higher dividend payouts. The portfolio as a whole has an annual return so far of 33.79%. Since the portfolio has been in existence for 13 months, that return will likely fluctuate up and down a lot more than the return of our dividend growth portfolio, which has existed for about two and three quarters years. Currently, the high yield portfolio's dividend yield is 4.17%, but the companies in it likely will not grow their dividends as much as the stocks in our dividend growth stock portfolio, which is why I tend to prefer the dividend growth stock portfolio. Therefore, this portfolio would be more geared toward investors closer to retirement. Having said that, many stocks in the portfolio have increased their dividends, pushing the portfolio's yield, based on the amount we have invested, to 4.96%. I can deal with that. Now, two strategies are being implemented in this, in this portfolio, as you'll see in the next few slides. Strategy one emphasizes a, emphasizes a high dividend yield over dividend growth. Strategy two also features stocks paying higher dividend yields, but places a bit more emphasis on recent dividend growth than strategy one in an attempt to try to get the best of both worlds, both high yield and dividend growth. I'm trying to be a little bit greedy in strategy two. And strategy two has been the better performer so far. The average investment in strategy two has provided a total return of 18.26% and has been held for an average of 175.1 days so far, which is an annualized rate of 41.86% using Excel's rate function. That's crazy high, that's not gonna continue. I wish. Because this portfolio is much less diversified than our dividend growth portfolio, when we sold Gilead Sciences last Monday, it was a relatively large amount of the portfolio. Its stock had increased nicely, which means its current yield had come down. By selling it and reinvesting in stocks with higher yields, it boosted the future dividend payouts for the portfolio. That's why, like we, well, that's why we like to occasionally sell a stock that we think is fairly valued or undervalued and buy something that is more undervalued and will uh, provide more dividends in the future. Now, it's not likely the portfolio can keep up an annual return that high since stocks historically average 9 to 10% each year. So we need to keep our expectations in check. On this slide, we're looking at the high yield dividend paying stocks we bought this week. And because the high yield stock portfolio currently lacks any technology stocks, for those that want to add diversification to this portfolio, I added to my site a list of technology focused investments that provide income with yields from less than 2%, like Microsoft, to yields as high as 10 to 12%, all of which I either currently invest in or have invested in. I'll also tell you which one is my favorite. Of course, the technology-focused investments with the higher yields don't have the chance to grow their distribution yields as fast as an investment like Microsoft or Broadcom. There's always a trade-off. One thing that's different about this higher yield strategy versus our dividend growth strategy on the previous slides is we only purchase eight stocks, so it's more concentrated, and we have two different strategies, as I mentioned before. Strategy one emphasizes a high dividend yield over dividend growth. This is perfect for investors in retirement or getting close. Strategy two emphasizes high dividend yield, but places a bit more emphasis on recent dividend growth in an attempt to try to get the best of both worlds, the greedy strategy. Because there are two different strategies, we have four stocks in strategy one and four stocks in strategy two, giving us two rankings. So each week we take $12.50 and split it between the eight stocks. So each stock gets a one-eighth weighting. Now, having two strategies within one portfolio also means that a stock could appear in both strategy one and strategy two, and that's usually the case. If that's the case, instead of the stock getting a one-eighth weighting, they get two-eighths, which is one quarter, which means 25% of that week's investment. Both strategies still only invest in high-quality stocks, meaning a quality rating of B- minus or better. The four high yield stocks we bought this week while implementing strategy one are Bristol Myers, CVS Health, Chevron, and Enterprise Products. The four high yield stocks we bought this week while implementing strategy two are Bristol Myers, Chevron, PNC Financial, and Morgan Stanley. This week's purchases have an average yield of 4.7%, 
with enterprise products coming in at the highest with a 7.2% dividend yield. Here's a look at Monday's ratings for competitive advantages, management, and financial health. And on this slide, we can see Monday's grade for recent dividend growth and current yield, as well as recent dividend growth history. And the last column, you can see their grades for dividend growth potential, which will be much lower than the stocks in our dividend growth portfolio, which consists of stocks with usually lower yields, but a greater potential for excellent future growth in those dividend payouts. And here are our trade confirmations from last Monday for the high yield stock portfolio. We took the weekly deposit plus any dividends we had recently received, plus the proceeds from the sale of Gilead, as you can see on this slide in red, and then invested the total into the eight stocks that were on our buy list for last week. So that's it for the dividend portfolios. Let's look at our two technology uh, stock portfolios. Because my students love technology stocks as well as crypto and options, we started two technology portfolios just for fun. And for the first one, on this slide, on January 1st of this year, I funded a Fidelity account with $1,000, and we invested it into only stocks offering products or services involved with certain technology themes. Unlike our other portfolios, we are not investing additional funds each week in this portfolio. We're sticking with the original $1,000 investment. The tech themes we built the portfolio around so far are artificial intelligence, AI, cloud computing, software as a service, cybersecurity, and big data. This portfolio can invest in sectors outside of the technology sector as long as the company is connected to one or more of our tech themes. For example, both Meta Platforms and Google are in the portfolio, but are both in the communication sector. So far, the portfolio has increased 25.5% in nine months. In comparison, technology ETF with the ticker XLK is up 17.6% over the same time period. Best performers so far are NVIDIA, 152%, Meta Platform, 65%, Broadcom, 60%, SAP, 54%, Peer Storage, 42%, and surprisingly, IBM. Now, back in late April, we started a portfolio that only invests in stocks that are officially in the technology sector. So this is our second technology portfolio. Like the other portfolios, we invest $12.50 each week into it and then boost that investment annually by the rate of inflation, which we haven't done yet since this, since this is its first year. I hesitate to call this a portfolio since it's limited to only one sector, but it's been fun to follow the volatile strategy. Since the portfolio has started, it has outperformed the two dividend portfolios over the same time period, but that's a short time since this was started on April 29th of this year, and its volatility has been extreme. So how is this portfolio different from the $1,000 tech portfolio shown on the previous slide? The portfolio in the previous slide is based on certain technology themes and therefore includes some stocks that are not technically in the technology sector, like Google and Amazon and Meta. So on this slide, I rate the top stocks for the week, but they must be in the technology sector. The average investment so far has been held for 74.1 days. No, excuse me, that's 77.2 days and has produced an average total return of 7.79%. Using Excel's rate function, that's a 42.6% annualized return. If we had instead invested in our weekly, if, excuse me, if we had instead invested our weekly investment into ETF XLK, which is a technology uh, ETF, instead of a 7.79% return, we would get a 3.8% return over the same time period. Note that all these stocks are high quality, meaning they must have a quality rating of B minus or better. Also note that the ranking system used for these tech stocks may differ from the rankings we use to rate dividend growth stocks because many stocks do not pay dividends. Therefore, in this ranking, we ignore the criteria that involves dividend growth, dividend payout ratio, etc. But we use the same valuation methodology we discuss in class that can be used on all large stocks, whether they pay a dividend or not. The four, our, our four top tech stocks last week were ASML, LAM Research, Taiwan Semiconductor, and Adobe Systems. All right. So in the comments, let me know if you have any other questions. And also let me know if there's any other type of investing videos you'd like to see. Here are the places you can reach me. YouTube, obviously, as well as my website, BeatStockMarket.com, LinkedIn, and Twitter. 
Remember, you can now find the dividend growth stock portfolio on beatthestockmarket.com as well as the high yield portfolio. And we've got those technology focused investments that produce income too. I'll see you again next weekend with a list of stocks we have purchased on Monday. See ya.